A leader has to take the risks. And there's uh, there, there's some cool stuff, man. I mean, you, awesome. you got a you got a great story. And well, I appreciate that. Yeah, you know, you you and you know, I, I was I, I kind I was thinking about that. What what is it called? Five guys, and uh, they make the hamburgers. You know, so yeah. you're like you're like the four guys. You know, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. four guys and lawn care. So, That's right. I love it. I love it, man. So, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to connect. And uh, what, what, what part of the world are you? I'm in Nashville. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee right now. How about you? That's what I'm talking about. Nashville. Love Nashville. (laughs) I love country music. I've been going to stagecoach every year, like four years in a row. So awesome. I love, I love uh, country music, but um, where are you at? Newport beach. Oh, very nice. Cool. California. So you've been to California? Yeah, I've never been down to Newport Beach. Uh, I hear that, that 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 area is beautiful. I'd like to check it out one day. Maybe maybe yeah. take a ro- ro- road trip. I, I drove the PCH one time, but I didn't go as far south as Newport okay. Beach. Okay. So, well, yeah. cool, man. <laughs> well, 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 tell tell me about the uh, tell me about the four guys, man. How'd you guys hook up? How how'd you guys become friends? And what the heck, man? I mean, how'd you how'd you get your start? Yeah. So, uh, when I started green pal, I had just sold my first company, which was a landscaping business. And I, I started mowing grass in high school as a way to make extra cash and stuck with a little lawn mowing business for 15 years, built that up to about 150 people. And then it was acquired. And after that, I took about six months off and then got really bored and thought I need a new mission. I need a new thing. And uh, I had the idea for Green Pal because uh, I knew it should exist. And I, and I was just talking to a couple of my friends about, uh, about the idea. And they were like, that's awesome. Uh, if you start that, I will literally work on it with you and I'll quit my job and, and, I'll, and I'll work on that project with you. And, and I thought, well, uh, I, need something, I need something to like pour my soul into. And, and uh, let's, that's a, so I thought, let's do it. And and so it was two, it was two friends that I had known for, uh, like 20 years. These were guys that I trusted. And then it was, a another guy that they had worked with at Dell computer. And okay. okay. so, so that's how we put the, the band together. And ideally when you start a, a startup like, like that, you have a hacker and a hustler, you have, you know, somebody who knows the tech side and you have somebody who knows the, the, uh, business side. And we right. had, we had four hustlers. None of us okay. knew how to code. None of us knew how to, none of us knew the first damn thing about building software. And so we had to, uh, learn the hustler side and Okay, we had to learn, learn how to code. And so that took like okay. three years, <laughs> but, okay. uh, but we kind of just stuck it out, stuck it so, out, so, by so, never, never, never giving up. So before, before we get, cause I, I want to talk more about that, but Tell us about the first, what was it? It was called Peachtree, right? Is that the, the first company you, That's you, right. you, you uh, started? So how did you start that? I mean, and what, what was that all about? Yeah. So started, uh, started Peachtree, which was the landscaping business uh, it, when I was 19, 20 years old. Oh, and uh, oh. I, I, I really, I, I didn't really want to be a lawn guy. I, did, I really didn't like the, the, the I hated the smell of, freshly cut grass and I hated smelling like gasoline and grass all day, but I saw business ownership as my lane. I, I thought mm-hmm. this could be the thing that, that helps carry me to places in life and owning a business. And, and I uh, made a little business plan with what I was learning in business school and, and uh, went to college, you know, during at night and then, and then mowed yards all day. And by the time I graduated college, I had five, six employees and, and just made a look and kept working the plan, uh, kept working, uh, the, the plan of building a large landscaping company and ended up building one of the larger, uh, companies in the Southeast in the industry, uh, eventually 150 employees around $10 million a year in revenue. And then it attracted the eye of a national company in the space in 2013 and, and they bought it. Uh, in- and so, so how do you, I mean, how'd you put together something like that? I mean, that, that's a, that's a pretty big endeavor. I mean, 150 employees and you're so you're, you're basically, how did you do it? So you, you, you started in the landscaping business and then you just started expanding. So you started hiring people to go out and do lawns and to do landscaping and do, I mean, did you do like, uh, you know, were, were you planting trees? Were you doing, you know, all the, the yardscape, hardscape, were you doing all that kind of stuff? I mean, was it a full, full service kind of landscaping company? 
Yeah, all that. So, okay. so basically, started off really, really, really small and humble, just just me, me and a push mower, and then and then like almost like a video game, one level at a time, grew it from me and a helper, and then me and uh, two helpers, and four of us in one truck, and then and then and then that got to be where it wasn't efficient. So then I bolted on another crew, and then the guy that had been with me for two or three years, he ran a crew, and then did that like four more times. I'm running a crew. I've got four other crews out there. I'm doing sales calls all day. I'm I'm literally like doing bookkeeping and invoicing and administrative stuff in the truck while my guys are mowing. And I did that for two or three years. And then and then a big moment in that business was when I didn't have to actually mow yards anymore. So mm -hmm. I had like five crews out going out every day. And then I'm back at the office doing sales, managing it. And then I guess year six or seven, I, I had an epiphany that I I wasn't in the lawn care business. I was in the sales business. I right, I, I had right, to come right. up with a, a sales engine. Uh, and, and figure out a way. Cause at the time we might've been in a million dollars in sales and I knew I wanted to get to 10 million. And so I had to work on a sales process, a way to identify okay. commercial clientele. How do we identify people who need our services and sell to them in a way that our competitors are not doing. And so I started to work that process that took like three years and eventually ended up hiring uh, a salesperson that worked a process that I kind of laid out through trial and error. And that helped me get to three or 4 million. And then and then, and then to your point, we didn't then did expand into uh, installation work um, and snow removal and full commercial landscape maintenance. At the at at the time I sold it, we probably had mm, I, I don't know anywhere it's like two thousand small commercial locations, like every every bank restaurant in in the whole region. We were we were servicing you. You um, were the landscape. So you're you're basically you're getting up in the morning and you're just. You're just looking for clients, man. You're just looking to add another spot, another business, another Absolutely. house to take care of. That's all you're doing. And then did you have a, a sales team as well? Like, did you have a bunch of sales guys as well? Yeah. At the end of it, um, well, you know, at the end of it for me, the company's still going today and they're making more money than I ever did in, in running that business. But um, mm -hmm. uh, the team had a sales team of about five, five people that I okay. managed. I managed, okay. I was a sales manager of the sales team. Okay. Um, and, uh, and, and we no longer did residential work. We, we only okay. did strict, strictly commercial work. So over about a 10 year period of time, we rebuilt the business from a, a residential service based business to a strictly commercial. So office complexes, um, apartments, uh, you know, airports, things like that. And so, um, transitioning, uh, from, from residential to commercial is, is what gave me the idea to build green power after I sold the company, because even though we made the transition, people still called my office every day. We would get a hundred people a day calling us. Hey, will you come mow my yard? Will you come mow my yard? And, and, and we never long, no longer did that. And so we had a, a value in running that business to always be helpful, no matter what. And so we would maintain a list of names and phone numbers of smaller service providers that did do those, those services. And then we would refer them. And, and so in effect, we were kind of like a local connector service. And, and so people would, would appreciate that, but sometimes they would call back and they would say, Hey, I called all five of those people and they didn't call me back and, right, or, right. or, the, or they, or they ghosted me or whatever. Right, and so, right. and so I saw that it was, it was broken, that, that, that a piece of technology could solve this for both sides of the transaction. So, so when I, when I sold the business and started green Pal, I, I was very much solving my own problem that I experienced. And so you're solving, so your, your whole goal was to help people. You're always connecting people. You were prospecting like crazy. You're always adding new business. And then another company comes around and they're like, Hey man, we want to buy you out. Exactly. Like walk me, walk me through what, what that looks like. And, you know, I, I don't know how much you can get into the numbers, but I'm, I'm really curious to know, well, for, first of all, uh, you know, walk us through a little bit of, of the numbers of, like, you know, what kind of profit do you make in a landscaping business or running a, you know, I, I was, I'm always curious about that kind of stuff. And, and then walk me through this acquisition, how'd that play out? And, uh, you know, was it difficult? Uh, was there challenges, you know, or, or was it pretty smooth? Yes. Yeah, good, good set of questions. So, um, they say great businesses are, are bought, not sold. Uh, my business was sold. Uh, I I intentionally uh, pursued a, an acquisition of the company. I had reached kind of a a plateau in my personal development. And one thing I didn't realize growing that business 
was that I was evolving into a whole new person every year or two. I was, I was uh, growing in, uh, from the challenges the business faced and, and, and learning my leadership style and learning my management style. And, and, and so it was kind of fun in that way. I didn't realize it at the time, but looking back, I could see that. And, and that kind of plateaued. I, I was no longer challenged by it. And that became very unsettling. And, um, and I thought, well, maybe I'll sell this company to create the space for me to do something else, because you really, when you're running a, an eight figure business with a hundred, over a hundred people, it's seven days a week. It is your life. It's your, it's your heart and soul going into it. There's no time for a side project. There's no time for, for doing anything else. And so I, I thought, well, I'll create the space so I could do another challenge. And, and uh, from the moment I had that idea of pursuing the acquisition to get, actually getting it sold was, was over two years. I had to, and I, and and one thing I didn't realize is that the way you run a business as a lifestyle business versus running a business that you intend to get acquired is are vastly different. Uh, yeah. Just just yeah. everything from like how you manage expenses to how you make investments into the business to how you manage from the spreadsheet versus managing from the heart. Right. Uh, they're, they're almost they're almost diametrically opposed and, and at odds with one another. And, and I didn't know that. And, and so I had to kind of like take the business down to the studs and and rebuild it to put in the things that it didn't have, like key managers, key cost cutting initiatives, uh, key dr ways to drive more profitability and squeeze more more revenue out of uh, out of uh, what we were doing. And, and so that took two years. And by the time I was done doing all that, I almost fell in love with the business all over again. Uh, but, but, uh, it, then it was acquired by a, a national company that has thousands of employees and, uh, they bought it and I helped them transition. And, and then, uh, and after that, I took like six months off, got bored, uh, got, I was very, very discontent and I needed a new mission. And so that's, that's when I started the, I came up with the idea of green pal and, and went all in on it. So four guys get together, a couple of Dell guys, and you're like, all right, man, let's go start this business. This company. All right. So explain to me what Green Pal is exactly and uh and and maybe some of the challenges you guys might have had, because of course you didn't, you know, you didn't have the tech down. So you had to figure that, you know, shit out. So how'd that all work out, man? Yeah. So the only thing that we had going for us is is we, we had a chip on our shoulder. We we really wanted to build something big. We 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 were four, four dudes that were really motivated. And I knew the, I knew the industry. I, I knew like I, I had the scars for, for the, the problems that needed to be solved. So at least we had that right, but we really had everything else wrong. We didn't know the tech side of it. We, we literally thought we could just pay a dev shop to build what we thought green pal should be. And then we would just market it and be off and going. And so we tried that. And so we pulled our money together. And we pulled like $150,000 together um, and paid a development shop 150 grand to build what we thought GreenPal should be. And it took like nine months. And then we launched it and it was a total failure, just dead on arrival. Wow. Didn't, have the, didn't have the features that needed. It was clunky, harder to use. Like, and if you build it, they will not come. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. And it was, yeah, it was really. just it, it real, real, real gut check. And, and so we had to... Like, we. We we had to like come to come to grips with oh we're playing a different game here this is not this is not the same thing that I was doing even though I was a second time founder I was very much a first time founder all over again and I had to like be honest with myself and it's like if you know if we're gonna be in the tech business we're gonna have to learn how to build tech and so we had to we had to rebuild the whole thing ourselves while learning how to code. And so went to YouTube university and took every online class we could take. My, my, co one of my co-founders went to a, a real boot camp where it was nine hours a day and they taught him server side uh, engineering. And, and we learned while building the app. Yeah. We had this other app in the store that we could test with. And we did, we did hustle up like a hundred people to use it just through passing out flyers, any means necessary to get people to use it. And so we were learning from them using the terrible app that we paid it to have built learning from them. And then, and then that feedback was going into what we were rebuilding it uh, and what we were actually uh, doing the second time around. And so that, that, that helped a lot because then we were building in based on actual feedback and not, not assumptions. So how so, hard, so, so how, I'm sorry to interrupt, but how hard was it though, just even mentally for you, because obviously you just sold this company 
it was a, you know, doing 10 million a year. It was a successful company. You're making a lot of money. I'm sure you had a nice home and you have a family and you're, you know, you're, you got a bunch of money in the bank and you're like, shit, I'm free. I, I, what, what the hell? I don't even have to do that. You know, I, I get, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm guessing no, you, that you were pretty financially stable at that time. And you're trying to re, you know, and you're, you're like still hustling, still working, still after it, still going, trying to build something and you got all this money in the bank. And so what, like mentally was that difficult to overcome that? Or you, you were just like so passionate, so on it, you just wanted to do something bigger. Really, really good question. And you nailed it. So I, I, I built and sold this company and, and it was like all of my future days were paid for from that moment forward. I didn't have to do anything. I, and, and I tried to not do anything. I tried to, I read a book by Robert Kiyosaki called the Cash Flow quadrant. And in that book, he talks about this guy called a capitalist and all this dude does is like he's in the middle of deals and he's doing investing and like I'm like man that sounds really cool i would just like to do that and and i tried to do that and it was actually really boring and so uh, i thought man i need another mission i need another re like if what is the reason i get out of bed in the morning and 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 if i didn't why would it matter and if it wasn't for me then what and like there was no answer there was no then what it, my, my business was the the answer to that question so so that was what, you know, forced me to get back in the game. Now, that said, the guy that bought my, my last company, he was probably worth $100 million. And, and he, he was a real arrogant dude, but he did give me a good piece of advice. Um, he, he, we, when we got the deal done, it was super contentious. And I'll never forget, he's like sitting at my desk, or I guess now his desk, and, and, or, or the desk he owned. He would never sit at it. But, um, and he said, hey, I'm going to give you some advice. Uh, you're independently wealthy, wealthy now. And uh, let me just give you some free advice. It's a lot easier to make a million dollars than it is to hold on to a million dollars and, or, or, or keep a million dollars. He said a lot of stupid investment ideas are going to be coming across your, 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 your plate now. And there's going to, you, you could very easily like waste all of this money and go back to zero again. And I, and, and that scared me. <laughs> and so I took, all the money I made from that business and, and like plowed it into um, single family homes. So just bought, bought rental property uh, all, all over the place. And so then I, so like I was cash poor. I was like the poorest, I was poor all over again. You were the poorest poor. millionaire that you knew. I had, yeah, I had no cash. I had all this property and it was cash flowing. Um, but, but I was using that cash flow to buy more property. And, and so I, like I was poor all over again. And, and that was kind of what I needed at the time because that dude was right. I, 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 I mean, there was a lot of stupid ideas that were coming across my plate that, that I would have invested in if I had all this cash sitting around. So that was uh, something that I did as like a forcing function because I never, I never wanted to go backwards. I never wanted to like ever pick up a weed eater again. I never wanted to go pull weeds out of somebody's garden again. I never wanted to pick up cigarette butts again. And so, and so I, I did that on purpose. And so when I had the idea to like build a green pal, it very much had to like sing for its supper day one. Like I, I didn't plow all the money back into it. So I had to hustle all over again and, and literally passing out flyers. And it was kind of what I needed at the time. I needed that humility. Um, and I needed like those lessons all over again. Cause that was what was required at that stage of the game. Um, had I had, you know, two or $3 million to throw at the idea, we would have just pissed it all away and, and, and burnt it on things that didn't matter. So it was exactly what I needed. And it was almost by design. I didn't quite intentionally like set out to do it that way, but it, it was the way that worked for me. And so that, that's how I experienced it. And it, yeah, it was very humbling. It was humbling to sell a $10 million business and then go back to try and like beg somebody to use this crappy ass app that I just built to, for a $27 lawn mowing. And literally yeah, yeah. taking taking their call when that twenty seven dollar lawn mowing didn't go right, like oh, it wow. was it was it was very humbling. But it was well, cool. It was, it was what I needed. Well, I, I think this is a great lesson for uh, for anybody that is going into business. Is you have to do the hard things, and not only do you have to do the hard things, but I mean sometimes you have to do everything. You gotta you gotta you gotta sell. You gotta do the books. Uh, 
you're you're constantly prospecting, you're constantly meeting new people, you're constantly building relationships. And then you got to go late at night when nobody's watching. You got to get on YouTube and you got to figure out how to build a damn app. You know, I'm like, I got people in my business that I I own a financial services company and I have about 1500 agents and we have 55 locations. And we, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that throughout these years of technology that they're getting left behind. They're going to, they're getting left behind because they're not adapting. And, and it's, and it's interesting to me because a lot of these people are not independently wealthy. They, they don't have the freedom to choices and the options. So I love when I see somebody like you, you know, independently wealthy, you got millions of dollars in properties and, and you're, you're fine. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, you're financially free and, and you could, you know, if you really had to, you could sell the property. If you really had to, you could just live on the cash flow from the properties, whatever. But the truth is, is that you, you were willing to go down to the bottom and start all over again. I always, you know, tell my guys when they're recruiting and we're looking for new agents, like some of the, the, the worst recruits that you can ever find are the people that they're already wealthy. They're already have enough money. You know, yeah. they already think they made it because they'll never go down to the bottom and go work it again. You know, they'll never go real, you know, I mean, at least most people, you're, you're definitely an outlier for sure to, go back and hustle it again and get after it again and, and go for it, which is admirable because most people would not go do that. And so, uh, so anyways, I, I love to hear when people are willing to go do what's necessary, whether they feel like it or they don't. Cause I'm sure there's a lot of times you didn't feel like it. You're like, what am I doing, man? This is like humbling here. And why, why am I doing this? And you did it because you, you had a dream and you had a, a, a desire and you had a, you wanted to make progress. You had a mission that you had a, you know, a vision of where you're going to go. And, and you went and did, and you went and did it. And that's, that's beautiful. And so, so then you, you get this app and it started working. So kind of green pal, just so everybody gets a, a clear picture. Green pal is like Uber for landscaping. And tell me if I'm saying that right. Is that yeah. how you guys picture it a little bit? That's right. DoorDash, Instacart, Postmates, Uber, any of these uh, conveniences we have to, to make real world things happen. Um, GreenPal is that for lawn mowing. So rather than calling all over the place trying to get a lawn care service, you just download GreenPal and, and you get five that you can choose from and they come out and take care of it for you. And it's funny, the, the, the vision my team and I had in 2013 when we started this business is the same damn thing we're working on here a decade later. Like we are like a 10 year overnight success. Uh, are now 300,000 people are using this thing every day to get lawn mowing started off really humbly with like 20 people. But, but uh, it's like the vision is it was the same then as it is now. Now, now the way we've gotten here has meandered and the path has iterated a, a million times, but, but uh, that was what we set out to start. And that's what we're still working on now today, a decade later. How do we make, ordering a lawn mowing service, cheaper, faster, smoother, more convenient, more reliable, more efficient. And uh, <laughs> even though we got 300,000 people using it, you know, we're still just dropping the bucket for how much, how much grass is getting mowed that we don't power. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, 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 and so it, it's, it's really a business that will never stop. It's kind of like if you cut hair, you know, hair is going to continue to grow grass right. continues to grow. So everybody's going to all for, for the rest of their life, they're going to need to cut their, uh, their lawn and, and want to do it. You know, it's interesting because when I, when I was growing up, my dad maybe go mow the lawn. So yeah. I don't know, like what, at what year did we all start using lawn Great care question. services? You know, I'm just curious. You probably know this answer. This is, so. It's a fascinating thing that I often wonder about from myself because when I was growing up in the industry, uh, to you know, 1995 was when I first started mowing yards. Um, it was a luxury service. My clients were in the wealthy part of town. These were the only folks that had the discretionary income to pay a lawn mowing service. Um, everybody else mowed their own yard, including me as a kid mowing mine. And and as you're, you make a really good point. Somewhere along the line this just became something that you just, you don't do. And, and uh, that happened in the last 20 years, maybe the last 10, 
But nowadays, nobody wants to do this chore, and they would just rather you know push a button and get it done. And that's that's what we're we're here to do. I think if they're you know the least glamorous, least sexy your idea or industry, the greater your chances of success. And that's that's been my my experience. You know, I'm not like a particularly brilliant dude. I was a C student in high school, barely graduated college. And, uh, and, and I picked this one non-glamorous industry to, to dedicate my life to, and it served me pretty well because I don't have a whole lot of competition trying to yank the rug out from under me. I can kind of take my time and just work really hard at it. And, uh, it's a simple thing that AI isn't going to disrupt and isn't going to steal from us. You know, we can kind of go at our own pace building out this vision. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I got into, I mean, I've been uh, selling life insurance and investments for 25 years. So, you know, you think about it, and, and I, I actually got started in 1995. So that's awesome. kind of interesting. And, and so, uh, but, but I look at even my business, same thing. I mean, it's not economy driven. People buy insurance, good times, bad times. They always buy insurance and uh, people invest money, regardless of what happens in the economy, even. I mean, the people invest on a monthly basis and they, they always invest, you know? So, so I, I love that, uh, that, you, that you mentioned that because it is important for people to pick. Sometimes people want to be in a glamorous field, right? but it's really oftentimes the unglamorous feel, uh, fields that some of these people, they get really, really wealthy. I mean, we're doing over a billion dollars a year in, in, uh, in, in sales. And awesome. so to, to be able to do that, if in a, in a, you know, even though the economy's bad, inflation's at whatever rate and interest rates are through the roof, people still buy insurance, you know, right. people, people still mow their lawn. And this is, uh, and you know, it's, 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 uh, interesting also that same thing with like, um, uh, washing your car. Like people don't wash their cars anymore. I, I used to always wash my car at the house. I never paid for washing the car. Right. So, right. so people don't do lawn care anymore. If you, and then we wonder, uh, you know, I mean, obviously these are, these are, uh, still items that, that, uh, you know, are, are kind of like <laughs> items that, that you don't really need. I mean, you could mow the lawn yourself and you could wash your own car, uh, but they're they're like luxury items, but yeah. they're luxury items for the masses now. And <laughs> if, uh, if somebody and, saw you in your driveway with a hose, a green yeah. hose, and a bucket and a sponge, washing your car, they probably think yeah. you lost your mind. Absolutely. And yeah, I used I to do I used to do that. Like yeah. so, it's it's funny. It's a lot of these things. Uh, a lot of these a lot of these things uh, are just now accepted as like conveniences that we just expect. And if you can position yourself to distribute one of those con conveniences and make them even easier, I think, you know, however humble they may be, there still needs to be an Uber for home cleaning. Two or three, two or three startups have attempted it and failed, but it still needs to exist. Somebody needs to build that. Like, uh, I, I, you know, and everybody feels for some reason, everybody feels poor and, and, uh, and feels like times are, are bad for some reason. But I, I go back and think about, you know, like, uh, you know, going out to eat was a, was a, was a, was a privilege and a treat. And I did change my own oil in my car and wash my own car in my driveway. So, so I'm not sure there's a weird thing, but if you could somehow position your business to be a part of that trend in a very uh, humble sector, I think, you know, and, and want to want to spend a decade doing it. I think that can be a, a way to lead yourself to success and, and to make something out of nothing. Well, that's another point, a really good point on your end that, I mean, let, let, let's be honest, right? Nothing good comes easy. You know, no. everything that is good, everything that is uh, real, everything that is, uh, you know, uh, majorly profitable, the shit takes time. I mean, you know, look, 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 at, look at actors, even like some of these actors, I, you know, when I was some people, they don't know this, but I, I did a little bit of extra work when I was young. I was 14 years old and I was in the movie Pretty Woman. Awesome. And I, I was just like a little extra in the back. Like you got to play, you got to play it on slow-mo when she spits out her gum on the Rodeo Drive. But you're or, there. You know, <laughs> but I'm there. I'm there in the background, you know? Nice. And, 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 I, and then I did like these other TV shows like Charles in Charge. I don't know if you, you know, some I'll people remember Scott, yeah. Scott Bale, you know? Oh, and, yeah. And, 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 but, but what was interesting is I met 
on one of those shows and I didn't have a speaking part, but uh, Paul Walker was awesome. just getting started in his life. And he was, I think he was my age. We're about the same age. And so he was on the show as well. And, and I always used to tell my agents that, I mean, let's be, let's be honest, right? Paul Walker at 14 years old, when he was on Charles in charge, nobody knew who he was. He was just a struggling little actor, just trying to make it in Hollywood. Well, we didn't, we didn't really know who Paul Walker was until he was 30. Incredible. Like literally, like from and 14 he was, to 30. He was grinding the whole time. The whole time. Nobody saw it. He probably made a million commercials. He probably made all these low budget movies. He probably went and did all these plays that nobody ever saw. And, but people don't see what really, like, like I could look at you and I could go, man, this guy's a stud. I mean, he's got a, a, an app that, you know, gets 300,000 downloads a day for business. And even if he made, you know, a dollar on every dang, you know, uh, click or, you know, whatever. I mean, a, a dollar on every project that he ended up set. I mean, that's a lot of money that this guy's making, building something of value that makes our life a little bit easier. Cause I love it. I think it's a great product. And, but, but, but nobody sees you up late at night. Nobody sees you early in the morning. Nobody sees you like you're, 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 you know, up in the middle of the night because you have this great idea or you're stressed about something or the damn app doesn't work and it sucks oh, yeah. and it's clunky. And you're like, I just wasted $150,000 with these boneheads over here that didn't do it correctly or whatever happened. And then you go, but nobody sees that. Nobody sees the, 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 the failures. Nobody sees the late nights. They just look at you and they go, that guy's lucky. That guy, you know, oh, right place, right time. He just had this brilliant idea to do this app and whatever. But, but guess what? We all had great ideas. We all have inventions in our mind. We all have thoughts to do. But you actually went and did it. You actually went. And by the way, $150,000, even though some people are like, well, I don't have $150,000. I don't have. Guess what? You could get a loan for $150,000. You could get investors for $150,000. You could, you could, you know, you know, beg for $150,000. I mean, there's so there's so many people out there. If you have a great idea, they'll invest in you. So it's, it's not about you having the 150,000. You did it. I mean, you actually went and hustled and grinded and found a, a crew of guys to build it with you. And you guys got up every day and you went to work and you tried to get better through the good times, through the bad times. 10 years later, everybody like 10 years. So that's a decade you spent of your life on one cause trying to build one thing, one focus, no wonder you're successful. And people got to get that. People got to understand that I don't care what business it is. I don't care what you do right now. If you're not like putting yourself all in on something, whatever it is, you're not going to make it. Building something great, becoming successful, getting some wealth on the beach is not easy. It's always hard. And, and the, the easier it is, the sleazier it is, right? I mean, there is no yeah, get I rich quick scheme, man. It just doesn't exist in the world. And people are like, they're, they're playing the lotto. They're, they're hoping to get rich quick and it just doesn't exist. So I don't know. What's your thoughts on that? I, I 100% agree. There are no overnight successes. Everyone that looks like an overnight success and, and you think it's an overnight success, it's always 5, 10, 15 years. It, it's always like, well, the thing, whatever it is you saw in the tech press or whatever, it was called something else and it was under the radar forever. And then it broke out as this other thing, or they tried and failed two or three other companies for five or 10 years before that. And they, they learned from those lessons and they plowed all of the knowledge into the thing that did, that did work. It's, it's always five, 10, 15 years of, of, of under the radar grind for the things that look like an overnight success. And it's always like little things done day in, day out, and they don't add up, they compound. And, and the next thing you know, five years or 10 years in, you're in a whole nother world. You're in a whole nother reality because you, you didn't give up and you stuck it out and you worked on that one thing and you just got better and better and better. And, uh, and, and I love the parallels between startup life, starting a business and, and, and the entertainment world, because I, for some reason, people can grasp the entertainment world a little bit better and they can, they can hear that story about an unknown actor who just breaks out and, 
uh, or a musician or something like that. And I, and I talk about this a lot. I'm from Nashville and, you know, every day we get probably a hundred people move here who want to be the next big country music star. And, and, uh, one of the parallels I see a lot of, a lot of is like, you start a business, you, 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 you work on the business, you work on the app, you work on the website, you work on all the things, getting the business going. And then you think that's the hard work. You think that's the hard part, but the hard part is actually getting customers. It's actually the sales. It's actually the marketing. It's actually the distribution. And the music business is just like that. Let's say you, you moved to Nashville. You learned how to play the guitar. You learned how to sing. You, you bought studio time. You cut an album. Right. Um, maybe, you got a, maybe you got signed. And like you did all this stuff, hard stuff. And then you think that's the hard work. And they're like, oh, I did all that hard work. And really the hard work is, can I get 10 people to show up to a show? that's the hard work. And, and, and that's where all of the success is, is made is, can I get the distribution? Can I get the exposure? And then whether it's the music business, the, the entertainment business or, or starting a, or starting our company, it's the same thing. The hard work is like, like building the company is and, and cutting the album is table stakes, getting 10 people to show up for a show, getting 10 people to give you a credit card number for a service. That's the hard work. And, and we over index on one and, and under index on the other. So just everybody, including myself, needs to be reminded of that. The hard part is the sales. All right. So let's talk sales, man. We got a lot of salespeople listening to you right now. You are a closer. There's no question about it. Some way, somehow, you're close, always closing. And so give us some tips or ideas on, uh, you know, that you can give some of these salespeople out there that want to, uh, you know, that, that, that want to close more. What, what, what ideas or thoughts can you, can you give them? First thing uh, in my world is do business with yourself. And this, this is kind of cliche, but if you can figure out a way, there's a weird thing that always happens between founders, CEOs, presidents, salespeople, whatever. The, the founder logic, the company logic, and the customer logic. And it doesn't matter if you're selling insurance, financial products, or lawn mowing. The company and the founder and the salesperson is looking at the problem from one perception and the customer is looking at it from another perception. And if you can close that gap, if you can close the gap between those two perceptions and, and try to put yourself in the shoes of the customer, it can really help the sales process a lot because then you, you become to understand their objections, understand what is the actual problem they're trying to solve. Um, understand, you know, what they're worried about and understand what, you know, what's going on in their head. So like mirror that thought sequence that's going on in their head when they're looking at your website. And, and, and one way I do that today is I, I still do, even though we have hundreds of thousands of customers, I still do an hour a day of customer support. So, so I, every day, whether it's phone, email, or text, I'm, I am answering customers' phone calls personally because I don't want that gap. I want to close that gap as much as I can. And that, that helps us in the sales process. Cause I know, well, people are worried about hiring somebody online because um, they, they don't know if they have the proper equipment. Okay. So we got to figure right. out a way to product productize that. And like, like literally like thousands of, of ideas have come from me talking to customers. So if you can figure out ways to close that gap, that can be helpful. Um, in a more traditional setting, one thing I did in my first company was, I would, I would try to get out of the selling lawn mowing business and I would try mm -hmm. to get into how do we sell, how do we figure out where our customers are trying to go and how do we, how do we match what we do with that? So one thing we would do is mm -hmm. we would say, like, like we, did a, we did probably 100 different apartment complexes and we would go to an apartment manager and we would say, what is your, uh, okay, so thanks for letting us, you know, quote the, the landscape maintenance. What, you don't mind me asking, what's the vacancy rate on this, on this property? Uh, we're at 88%. Okay. Well, um, uh, you know, we went to the, to the apartment association meeting last week and, and, and we, we know that 95% is the average for this area. Right. Let's see how we can get you to 95% through landscape maintenance. How do we, how do we, maybe we, we have an idea. We can install a flower display by the model. We can install this, this feature by the, the by the road, maybe to draw more people in. And, and even if we got, if we moved them a point or two, we, we were no longer in the lawn mowing business. We were in the solutions business. So if you can figure out ways to figure out where your customer is trying to go and what it is you do that help to help them get there and make the conversation mm -hmm. about that, then it's less selling and it's more like it's more solutions oriented. And this right. stuff is this stuff's pretty cliche, but it, it's worked for me. 
Um, and it's, well, it's actually more difficult to do than to bang your head against the wall, actually. But if you can do it that way, you're going to make life easier. No, I think it's, I think it's powerful because, I mean, all, all you're ever doing as a salesperson, in my opinion, all we're ever doing is just trying to ask very good questions. You know, I think That's sales right. is always just about questions. If I, can, if I can get you to what you want, you know, if I'm trying to recruit somebody, all I'm, all I'm ever doing is I'm just saying, you know, if I can get you what you just told me you wanted, is there any reason that would, you know, anything that you could think of that would stop you from, you know, moving forward with me? I mean, if That's I can, right. if I can get you that, would you come with me on this ride? Can, can we do this together? And, and the truth is, is most people, they don't care. This is why I think a lot of salespeople, they struggle because they don't really care about the customer. They care about the sale. They're counting their commission check before they even have the commission check instead of really trying to figure out how can I do a good job for my client and give them what it is that they desire. Because right. at the end of the day, I'll pay anybody whatever they need to, you know, I don't, I don't care what I got to pay them. As long as you can get me to where I want to go, well, then I'm going to be your customer for life. Just help me get what I want. And that it's, I think is the big difference, right? It needs to be said. It needs to be said again and again and again. And, and, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm dealing with this right now. I'm, I'm wanting to buy an investment property in, in, in uh, the Miami area. And, and you would, th I'm, I'm, I'm having like hell trying to get a decent real estate agent to, to help me with what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get to a point where I have a, a cash flow producing investment property. And you would think a market as robust as Miami, they, they would like, okay, here's, I found you five. Here's the pro formas. Boom, boom, boom. And no, it's like, well, I set up some showings for this thing and that. It's like, no, you're not, you're not understanding where I'm trying to get to. Help me get there. And it's, and it's, it's, it needs to be said over and over and over and over again. Where is the customer trying to get to? And, and tee up the solutions. Make it a no-brainer. Make it so easy to do business with yourself. Um, and we, everybody needs to be reminded of that. And then I want to come back again and again and again. And tell right? my friends I mean, about you. That's it. I mean, it's it's so it's so fun. I love when you finally find somebody that's good, that follows up, that does what they're supposed to do. Like, I think probably, you know, to a fault, it's one of my pet peeves is that, you know, when somebody doesn't do what they say they're going to do. I yeah. mean, you know, like you, I mean, one of the, 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 the worst things that I ever have to do, I, I own uh, real estate as well. And I own, uh, com uh, some commercial property and, uh, and, and you know, you, you want to get somebody to do some work for you, right? It's, so it, it, it's not like, I mean, you know, especially in the building, I mean, you know, it's, it's it, so some of these, so, some of these, these, these quotes get pretty big. And then, but it's like, if, if you tell me you're going to be there at noon, you know, don't show up at one o'clock. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's like, I don't, I don't ever, you know, it's, it's the wildest thing to me because it's not like you're so busy. You don't want to make any more money. Like I don't know any salesperson that like has so much business. They don't want to make any more money. Right. We all want to make more money. If we can get one more sale today, that's good for the client. It's good for us. It's good for everybody. Cause we're making money and it's a win-win, but I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, you you can't put me in your calendar and make sure that, like, I, I would, I mean, this is in the old days, right? I used to have to go to people's houses. Now it's everything Zoom now, but I mean, I, I used to have to go to people's houses and I'd drive all the way across town and I'd get to their house and, and but I would always go early. I would yeah. always, and I, there would, I mean, hundreds of times I would sit down the street because I wouldn't like to get there too early. I, I don't want to mess them up if they had, if they were doing something else, they were yeah, expecting but, me there at one o'clock, right? You were on deck though. <laughs> you but I was, there. I was, I was down the street, right? Yeah. Probably people were looking out their, their windows going, who's this stalker out on the street, you know, sitting in his car, you know, like better, you know, who is this guy? But I would go down the street. And so that way I knew that I couldn't traffic, couldn't mess me up. Nothing else could mess me up because I figured if I was there 10 or 15 minutes early, I was always on time. I'd show up to that door, maybe, you know, one minute, two minutes beforehand, and, and I would be there for them. And I know, and I just, I, you know, obviously you can't um, quantify this, but I know that I got a lot of business through those early years because right. I was trusted. My clients, they trusted me. 
I, even though I was a young guy, I started at in business at 21. So I was doing business with people that were 45 and I was 21 and they were buying from me like crazy. And so, because I think that I, I really stepped up my game so I could be reliable and people can trust me that, that they were going to get the service that I was promising them. So uh, do you see that sometimes in the sales business that some of these sales guys, sometimes they just, uh, Absolutely. Uh, they, 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 they don't show up. It's comically bad. And it's almost easier than it's ever been to go from zero to one. You, you can literally, you know, if you want to lay it out like 10 levels of a video game, level one, two, and three, you can just get through through sheer hustle and, and literally outworking your, your competitors. And just and like the, the, one of my favorite quotes is Steve Martin. He says, be so good. They can't say no. And if you can just be so good, they can't say no, that'll get you through the first four or five levels of the game to where then you can build routines, systems, processes around that hustle. The problem is a lot of people want to skip levels one through three and they want to just go to level four and you can't do that. You got to beat those first three levels. You got to roll up your sleeves. You got to be there early. You got to, you got to sit, sit a, a, a quarter mile down the road and, and be ready and, and, uh, and you gotta be willing to do that. You can't skip those, those, that, that, that hustle piece. And I see this, I mean, I see this every day with running green pal. I see the, uh, which vendors do well and which ones don't. And, and I see it just in my day-to-day -day life. Uh, in fact, I saw, I saw it the other day when I was, when I, when I sold my first company and I, I, I left Nashville, mm -hmm. um, I had to sell my house. And, and I remember, there was this kid that knocked on my door who wanted to clean my pool. And, and I had a pool guy, but for some reason, this kid uh, reminded me of myself 10 years <laughs> earlier. He said, man, I really want your business. And I was like, okay, no problem. You, you, you can, you can take care of it every week from here on out. And I, but I said, but I'm selling my house. He goes, no problem. I, I want to be able to help you sell the house with a crystal clean pool. And I'm like, wow, that's cool. And, and, that's and he awesome. like, he's like, dude, do you have any showings coming up? I'm like, actually, yeah, I got a showing, uh, this Saturday, he's like, he said, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll come over Saturday morning. I'll be there at nine o'clock and I will, I will put some pool toys in there and, and we'll make it look lively and we'll make sure it's crystal clean. And I'll be damned if he didn't do that. And, and I paid him and then I, and then, and then I didn't, I did end up selling the house and I almost forgot about all that. Well, fast forward 10 years later, um, I'm back in town for something and I'm just driving down a random street like a random commercial artery through the middle of town. And I see on the side of the, of the road, a professional storefront with the sa same, same name, same logo, everything, 10 trucks out front, uh, like a, like a hundred thousand dollar front end loader. And, and it's a pool company I'm, and it's backyard blues pool service. That's the same kid 10 years ago. And I'm like, damn, that is him. Look at that. He, he's got a fenced in lot with trucks back there. And I mean, he looks like he's in service and installation now. He's installing pools. And then I was like, I wasn't the least bit surprised. I wasn't the least bit surprised because I could just see from the hustle that he had 10 years ago, he was probably 20. And I, I just wasn't the least bit surprised that he had now probably built a $5 million business, maybe $10 million business in a decade. So it's like, be so good. They can't say no, especially through levels one through three can, can help you go from zero to one. And you put yeah. yourself on the map. Yeah, how how you do the little things is how you do everything. And, That's right. And uh, yeah, this is a good lesson. I, I hope people are getting a lot out of this. Um, you know, look, I I want everybody just you know do me a favor before the day's over. Um, uh, you know, get a get it in touch with uh, with Brian, and uh, and ask him. You know, just maybe on Instagram because you're on Instagram, right, Brian Clayton. Yeah. That's right. Brian M. Clayton, just drop me a DM oh, there. Brian M. Clayton, drop him a DM, say, hey, look, I saw you on Wealth on the Beach podcast with Daniel Alonzo and uh, and reach out and, and look, I mean, check out the app, right? Go to greenpal.com, check out the app and see if you can, uh, you know, see if you can get your, your, your lawn services through them. Uh, it's a great service. It's very easy to use. I actually got on it and I was messing with it a little bit and it's very easy to use. Uh, and, and, and it's just a new way of doing things. And, and I think it's just really convenient and, and it works really, really well. So, uh, you know, try it, check it out. And then look, if there, if there's any challenges with it, or you think you have a, uh, an idea for it or whatever, reach out to Brian, man. He's hit, hit like, me up. 
He wants to know. He wants to get better. And by the way, this is how you should be thinking as well as somebody that's trying to grow your own businesses out there. Uh, you should be thinking that same way. You should want feedback. You should want mentorship. You should want accountability. You should want somebody to tell you when things are not right. Every, anybody could say, oh, man, you're so great. Everything's wonderful. Everything's fantastic. But just remember, anybody that wants to do something great in their life, we always, I always loved the feedback from my mentor. I always loved when he told me when I, things that I was doing wrong, I never took it personal, never got upset when he said, Hey, you're doing this wrong. You're doing that wrong because it allowed me to change and grow and alter, uh, you know, for, did, did, did you have a, a mentor, Brian? I mean, looking back, I mean, was there some, somebody or something or a class or something that, that, that helped you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, to your point, success is a lousy teacher. You only learn from the things you screw up and things you do wrong. And the only way to know where you need to, what you need to work on is through feedback and through what your customers are telling you. And, and yeah, I had, I had a couple of mentors growing up that, that I was actually mowing their yard uh, in my twenties. And one thing I saw, I saw was, was like these people living in the wealthy part of town, they're not particularly brilliant or bright. They just did it. They just did it. They they opened that business. They 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 and they bought that 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 commercial building and fixed it up and then and then rented it out. They just did it. They didn't ask for permission, and I that was very inspiring to me. And and uh, and one thing I took away from them is like if they could do it, I could do it too. And that's what I hope anybody listens to an interview with me is like if that guy can do it, I can do it. You know, I I, I this stuff is not as hard as you think. You don't have to ask for permission. You can just get started and get in the game and, and work one level at a time. And like we were talking about earlier, roll your sleeves up and, and, and just, just grind it out. And in five years, you'll wake up in a different reality. Um, and, and that's, that's how I experienced it. Yeah. I had some mentors, but, but 99% of it was, was, was sitting out, sitting outside the front of the, of the house early uh, about a hundred feet down the road. <laughs> I guess that's like 99% of the success is showing up. And, and uh, so I, I appreciate the conversation and I, I appreciate the ability to, to reinforce that kind of stuff because it needs to be said. It needs to be said more. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a whole nother wave of the world right now that uh, it's, uh, you know, there's so much victim mentality. There's oh, so yeah. many people that just, I mean, it's somebody else's fault all the time. There's another excuse. It's negative. It's uh, it's it's just negativity to me is gross. You know, I, yeah. I get so turned off by negativity. I get so turned off by uh, people that have a defeatist mentality and also like an abundance. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm writing my second book. My first book is Wealth on the Beach. It's on Amazon. A lot of people have checked it out and uh, awesome. it's it's done really well. But but my second book is going to be uh, about having a badass mindset, and I think mindset is everything. It's abundance mentality. It's being grateful. It's a it's a lot of those things. But to really dive in, what we're doing is we're diving in, and we're we're looking at the stories of the great people of our generations, our you know these last few generations, and looking at their stories and saying, okay, you know why are they different? Like, why is a Brian Clayton, you know, why is he successful while, you know, you're in the top 1% of, of America? You know, why are you in the top 1% of America versus, you know, that guy that's, you know, you know, uh, sitting in front of the liquor store with that brown bag drinking a, a 40 ounce or, you know, like, what, what's the difference of Brian and that guy, right? Because we all feel sorry for the guy, right? We all like, oh, you know, really feel bad for the guy. And, you know, obviously you want to help him if he's, you know, if there's something wrong mentally or whatever, I get it. We want to help those people and be kind and be empathetic as well. But the truth is there's a lot of people that got out of college, you know, they graduated college and they, they never, they never put, picked up a book again. They never That's read right. a, a self-improvement book again, right? They, they, they never, they never went through YouTube university. You know, they, right. they never watch, you know, listen to a podcast or watch the podcast. And, and it's just, to me, it's so sad because they're, they're not where they could be and they're blaming the world or they're blaming the government or they're blaming some outside, you know, uh, reason 
instead of just looking inside themselves and saying, look, like, I, I mean, look, I'll, I'll be honest, man. I mean, you know, if, if, if I, you know, I had a little bit of a, a argument with somebody the other day and, and I, I don't think it went really well. And, uh, and, and I'm not happy about the, the, you know, the conversation, I'm not happy about how it went. So, you know, what I did was, you know, I put in some ear pods, I put in a book and I listened and I'm, you know, just reminding myself of certain things that maybe I did a long time ago that maybe I don't do as well today. And I got to go, okay, if I want to continue to build great relationships with great people, I got to re remember certain things and be reminded constantly because it's kind of like a shower, right? We, we, That's right. you know, every day we take showers, we, we restart, right? We begin again. And we got to constantly remind ourselves by, by self-improvement, by podcasts like this. And I love hanging out with guys like you because, you know, you're just living proof that, uh, you know, a guy that just had a dream can go from zero to, you know, living a really great life and having a purpose and having a passion. And this is, this is like, that's a blessing, man. I mean, to, to be able to find something that you can put your heart into. And, and I would, and I would tell everybody that's listening or watching you right now, if you don't have a passion, if you don't have a desire, if you don't have a mission, like you got to go get one. Like, so, I don't know where it is. I don't know what it's going to be for you, but man, you better go find a mission as quickly as possible. Go find something to, to put your heart and soul into, uh, because otherwise, man, life sucks. I yeah, love that. I have boring. missions. It's boring, man. I mean, I, I want to, I, you know, progress equals happiness to me. I mean, I'm happy when I'm doing something, when I'm making uh, waves. And, and so anyways, this is, uh, this has been fun, Brian. Um, so, so tell us again, how we can connect with you and, and, and then just kind of finish off where, you know, just tell me a little bit about what's the next step for you and, uh, and green pal, man, what, where are you guys going? Yeah. Well, again, thanks so much, Daniel, for having me on. I, I really appreciate it. I've had fun. Um, so right now we're, we're nationwide in the United States. We want to be soon in Canada, UK and Australia. So that's one thing we're working on well, trying to get to a million customers uh, on a weekly basis is the next growth hurdle. Uh, we've been doing this 10 years, but it's still day one. Uh, you know, we have so much further to go. And, and like you said, this is, this is my mission in life. It's how do I, how do I improve the lives of landscaping contractors through this app that I have used and uh, that I have built and how do I make their life a little easier? And, and it's why I get out of bed in the morning. It's why, I, it's why I, if it wasn't for me, then what? My business is the answer to that question. And so uh, doing more of that is, is what we're going to be working on. And anybody who wants to check it out, you can, you can just go to greenpal.com. And anybody who wants to hit me up, just find me on Instagram, Brian M. Clayton, and just drop me a DM there. Love it, man. Good stuff. Powerful stuff. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of your day. Um, and for everybody else, man, continue to dream bigger than ever, uh, get after it. I mean, you gotta get after it. I mean, if you don't get after it, man, you're just wasting time. You gotta get after it. You gotta find a purpose, find a mission, get after it, and then most importantly, do it now. God bless you. We'll see you at the top.